Hello, everybody, and welcome back to part two of this beginner playthrough and tutorial for Crusader Kings 3. I'm Karex. And man, it is so difficult to teach these games. There are so many interconnected systems in these games. I mean, our religion ties into our diplomacy, it ties into our military capabilities, our potential, our opportunities. Like, I mean, I'm just trying to, like, I'm not teaching anything now. I'm really, like, in the first episode, it was very long, and I feel kind of bad about it, to be honest. Um, because it's just there's so many systems and we were just covering things we're kind of flying over them. it's important to note we are not we were not teaching the game in the last episode we were we were trying to build a thematic ground uh, a, a thematic foundation that we can build upon right just in terms of at least like okay let's just get familiar with kind of what we're looking at here currencies okay this is a good button to see what the suggestions are what the current situation is and read through this and work through those ideas which we haven't done yet we were just trying to see that these tabs over here is how our country is organized, the different matters of our country, whether our council, our military, our realm, administrative, you know, rebel rebellion, and so on and so forth. It's organized over here. That's how that's organized. We have our character over here. This is some of the stuff that our character, this is who define this is what defines us as a person. This is how we see the world. This define this tells us what we're good at and what we're bad at. So on and so forth. And stuff and this is our family and these might be important characters for different reasons and things this is our heir we might care deeply about what this guy gets up to and, and so on and so forth right in fact you know what i'm thinking we can actually go into our military let's do something kind of funny at the start here let's actually force this guy to be on the battlefield now he's not particularly good at he's got a poor prowess right but let's force our son on the battlefield because the truth is we kind of noticed that our son is not particularly amazing in anything. And if our son was to have an accident, that actually might not be the worst thing. We're still young. We're still healthy. Our, our wife is actually quite old. Our wife cannot have any children anymore at 45. But we can actually have concubines. So we can get concubines and have children that way. And those children, we will have more control over their education and potentially their stats and their potential and stuff like that. So hopefully we will be able to have more kids, more sons, and maybe those sons will be uh, better trained to succeed, succeed us, um, and so on and so forth. So, But for the most part, we haven't taught anything yet, right? We're just trying to we're trying to go slow. There's so many interconnected systems. There's so much UI. It, it, is, uh, it is confusing. There's no way that we're to make it not confusing, right? But we're trying our best here, guys. We're trying our best here. So I apologize if I take any for anything for granted, but that's the way I'm trying to teach this game is step by step in a way that we're not taking any for anything for granted. Gold, yeah, you know what gold is, but you don't know what we can do with gold, right? You know what prestige is, but we don't understand that in the context of the game, right? Like thematically, we can understand being prestigious and stuff, but we don't know how we can use that, all the different ways we can use that in the game. And that's the things that we're going to be going sort of step by step here. We are going to be unpausing soon. I think there's two things we need to evaluate. One, it says we can raise our armies because we're at war, right? We are at war. Well, let's refer. Let's remember that. This button down here tells us these banners down here represent all the wars that we're in, and we can be in multiple wars. So we did not start this war. We're just in this war. We're actually not particularly that concerned with this war. However, however, um, we could go over here and help, and that could actually build up. That could give us an opportunity to build our prestige to help with the war. Although it will hurt our economy to raise our armies, right? If we raise our armies, that will be a monthly expense uh, to pay our different levies and stuff like that. So that's something that we have to sort of think about a little bit of whether or not that's worth it to us. Because the Hafton's actually going to have no problem winning that by himself. He's got 5,000 troops right here. He's going to be totally fine. In fact, Ivor's not in the war with us, but we know uh, just uh, from me playing the game, Ivor's in their own war up here. So Ivor's going to be coming down here smacking these same guys too. In fact, I think Ivor's in a couple different wars, including wars against uh, Mercy and Wessex. So, so all of the sons of Ragnar are basically just beating up on the uh, Christians, the Anglo-Saxons in that region right now and stuff like that. We don't necessarily have to, to worry about moving into there. Let's click on this. I always like to click on this, even as someone that's played the game for 200 hours. I love clicking on this. It does say that we should, we have a lot of prestige. Okay. We have a lot of prestige. Maybe we would like to spend some of this prestige to recruit some men at arms. These are the cheapest dudes. These are, but these are quite a bit better than regular levies. You know what? I like that idea. Let's get some men at arms. What we could do is we can come in and we've gotten a new uh, group of men at arms. You can have four different groups. So we can come in here and we can now do bowmen. We could have some bowmen. Okay. Yeah, that's good. We can see the light infantry dudes are good in the forest and in the taigas. Now, guess what? There's a lot of forest and taiga over in this area. So we're going to be fighting to unify Sweden 
turns out, in fact, I think there's a map mode over here. If we go to this plus here, we can see terrain. We can see all of this is taiga. All of this is taiga. And this is, uh, some of this is actually plains. So this is a map mode that just kind of tells us what's going on here. Where are the forests? I guess what makes sense is this is taiga. Forest would be down here, right? These are all forests down here. So the taiga, but it makes sense that a lot of this is taiga. So these skirmishers are good in the taiga. It's specifically saying. So they get like extra advantage, combat advantages and stuff in the taiga. The bowmen also are pretty good in the taiga in the forest, which is kind of interesting to me because I would think the bowmen would be good in the open areas, but I guess the open areas make them vulnerable and exposed and stuff too. Maybe that does make sense, right? Like ambushing from from like a hill or or in a forested hill or something like that. It'd be pretty sweet to be an archer in that situation, I guess, right? So actually both of these uh, troops are pretty good um, in these in the terrain that we're going to be fighting in. Whereas the horsemen are actually get negatives in hills uh, and don't get any benefits for the forest. They're good in the flatlands. And there are a lot of planes here, don't get me wrong, but they're also very expensive. The horsemen are incredibly expensive, as it makes sense. The uh, pikemen are good in the hills, so on and so forth. We can see, though, that the um, the skirmishers are actually countered by archers. Of course, our bowmen aren't going to shoot our own skirmishers. The light footmen, or they're also called the skirmishers, are countered by the heavy infantry. The heavy infantry are pretty expensive. We don't expect a lot of, of people to have those uh, early in the game. So I think, yeah, I think we could actually get some bowmen. And we have a thousand prestige at the start. So spending some of this stuff is expensive, but it's not the end of the world. Now, what we could do is instead of uh, just doing another, like, let's say we wanted another hundred light footmen, uh, we wouldn't actually go here and make a third light footman group. We would not do that. No, no, no. You go into here and you can increase the size of the actual groups themselves. They can be upgraded uh, up to five times, one out of five size, it says. So we can upgrade this again at the cost of more prestige. And maybe we do that up to 300. And maybe we go here. Oh, oh, see, we're losing prestige now per month. Not good. Not good. So we're going to have to work on that. So let's 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 cool our jets a little bit there. Let's cool our jets a little bit because there's a lot of other things that we need to spend prestige on. And we'll see that as we go. So we got some men at arms. In fact, now I'm actually wondering, dang, do we need to bop one of these because now we're spending so much? That's because they're they're unraised. It says, wait a second, full maintenance uh, 0.8. Unraised maintenance 0 0.2. I think this might update when we unpause. Why is it saying the unraised maintenance is so high there? I guess each grouping is 0 0.2 and then that's 0 0.6 and this is 0 0.3 and it's all adding up somehow. We'll have to see if that actually sticks or not, but but we could do a little bit of minus prestige per month is going to be okay. We're going to be able to rally that around. Again, we, we notice that our map is not looking familiar to us. So we come down here and we, or we could hit E, but we go to the realms. We always want to go back to the realm so we can actually see the world broken up by the different leaders. So we've we've got some men at arms. Cool, cool beans. We can actually create new duchy titles, but this is expensive, right? This is going to cost us 125 gold. It gives us prestige though to create these titles, so we can't afford these. But these are titles that we can make because we have a we have a large um, amount of this. We have more than 50% of this duchy is under our control. So the game is saying, hey. You have the majority of these duchies under your control already. You can make these duchies official. In fact, we control this one entirely. So we could if we could make this duchy, and that would be another title that we could we could uh, give to someone, or we could keep ourselves and and just sort of give us that would give us more prestige per month if we had more titles that we controlled and, and some other things. It just lets us structure our country a little bit uh, better. You want to be creating these different titles and and having everything sort of um, sort of uh, structured or sort of like it's like a pyramid structure sort of and, and you kind of want that pyramid structure set up as much as you can okay so we're not going to be doing that we're not we're not going to worry about it. powerful vassal expe accepts uh, expects a position this guy it does not like us and this is the dude because we fired him from our stewardship this guy's terrible at his job we don't care about this guy but he doesn't like us he is someone that's going to try to fight uh he's going to try to scheme against us potentially what i'm going to do is and he's also going to contribute less taxes and less money because he doesn't like us what we could do with this guy is instead of actually he wants a council position forget that i'm going to right click this to delete that i'm not going to give him a council position this guy's terrible at the uh, different jobs he's not he's not skilled enough to be on our council instead i'm going to actually right click him and we're going to sway this guy we're going to try to butter this guy up so we can actually do a personal what's called a personal scheme on this guy start scheme this is not a negative scary scheme it's it's a that's why the rose is there it's a, it's a friendly scheme we're going to scheme this guy and we're going to try to butter this guy up and make him happy. So he doesn't like us anymore because we fired him from his job because he was terrible at it. 
So we're going to instead sway him and, and sort of cool uh, cool the tempers there a little bit. And we can do that. We can also send him a gift, right? Um, we could send gift if we had money, but it's expensive. We don't need to do that when we can just sway the guy. We can uh, we can grant titles, make them happy. We can do different interactions with characters by right-clicking on them. That's something we haven't talked about, right? We can right-click on our wife and see what, what we could do. We could divorce her. She's over the age of giving children. We not might not be that interested in, in having this wife anymore. But for the most part, she's actually still quite uh, she's quite smart and she's got she's intelligent. She's got a fortune builder. She could be a good educator for our children and stuff like that, our future children and stuff. So we don't want to. I don't. I don't think we want to divorce her or anything like that. And there could be a cost to that we could click on that and see what we'd have to spend piety to divorce her, and she would dislike us. There's not really. We have piety to spend. We could do that, uh, but we don't have to do that either. We could, we could try to murder her. That would be a hostile scheme. That's why there's a dagger there. We're not good at doing stuff like that. If we tried to, it would be like a very low chance uh, to succeed, right? And this would also, because we're honest, it would cause stress. So this is against what our character would want to do normally. We could appoint her as our court physician. There's just different little interactions, right? So if you ever need to interact with character, right-click on them and, and so on and so forth. Speaking of which, we probably do want a court physician. That was one of our poor, uh, empty slots here. We don't have anyone that's a court physician. Ideally... Uh, we could go searching for one, but that's expensive. We could just find someone in our court that is a good learning skill. This person's got a good learning skill. Let's appoint this person to be our court physician. That's going to give us, a, we could pay them a little bit to appoint them. That makes them happy too, which is kind of nice. And now that person could actually be our court physician with the 14 learning skills. So we want our physician to be a learned person. That kind of makes thematic sense. So that person's going to be appointed great. Um, it really probably should have said that in the current situation, but we could declare tons of wars. That's because we're the Vikings. We don't really need much of an excuse to attack someone. We could just go over here. We could right-click this foreign leader, declare war, boom. We can attack this person. We could pick the reason for the attack. We could just conquer them based on... Um, we could conquer their entire duchy if we wanted to, but there's reasons why we can't quite do this yet. Um, but this costs piety to do this kind of war, or we could spend prestige to do these other different kinds of wars, right? We could subjugate them at 500 prestige. That's expensive, right? We just spent 300 prestige on getting troops. Now it's saying that we actually have to spend prestige to go to war sometimes. So there's different things that we can do. We could just raid them for captives. That costs piety. This can gain us more piety, though, by sacrificing these captives that we do. That's part of our religion. So there's different things that we can do against our neighbors. And, and it's just saying that we can declare tons and tons of wars. We're not going to worry about all the different wars that we can declare. We're going to try to strategically pick the people we want to declare war with and figure out how we can do that and 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 how we can build the ways, uh, the, the cost is barely the cause for war against them if we don't already have one. But as the Vikings, as Bjorn, we basically have a reason to go to war with everybody. We could click on almost anybody in the world and we could just declare them just because we are Vikings. We don't need much of an excuse to go to war with somebody. But the excuse to go to war, that's a justification for our own people, right? And that's a justification for the diplomatic environment around us to justify that war. That's important to maintaining good, positive relations diplomatically and politically within our country by having a reason to go to war. And again, the Vikings, it doesn't take much to convince our people to go to war, um, but it might uh, sort of convince, we need something to convince our our neighbors that what we're doing is is, is just. This is kind of interesting here because quite honestly, this person here is uh, somebody that could become our concubine. And we do want to have concubines. But the thing about this, find concubine. The concubines actually increase our prestige. We're actually losing prestige per month because we don't have concubines. Minus 0 0.2 because we are under the concubine limit. So actually, if we had concubines, we'd actually be gaining prestige per month rather than losing it, which is kind of interesting. That being said, this concubine here has a congenital trait that's negative. It's in red. Lisp. They have a lisp. And if we had children, there would be a chance that those children would inherit this negative congenital trait. That's not great. That's certainly not great. So I'm actually kind of thinking I'm not in love with this potential um, character that, that is wanting to be our concubine. This person has a decent traits. Could we make them a concubine? No, they've already, right, they've already, um, they already have a, uh, they're already married. This is the only person that's able to be our concubine. And quite honestly, I don't know if we want to have kids with this person uh, in, in, that, in that sense. So if we do want to have kids, 
Um, but unfortunately, our court is a little small right now. As we go, we could go capture prisoners and we could actually capture people that can become concubines and, and so on and so forth. We could also find guests that come to our court. We could recruit them and they can become concubines and, and all kinds of different things. If we go to this person's court, just hypothetically, can we recruit this person to be our concubine? No. We could try to import this person to the court, but they're already in another court, so they're not going to do that. I was just wondering if unmarried people in our vassals' courts could be our concubines, but no, it doesn't look like it. They need to be in our court. They need to be in our court. Hmm. Hmm. So hopefully we'll be able to, to get more options with that in the future. But for the most part, I think we're actually kind of ready to unpause here. Uh, we could talk a little bit about um, sort of the administrative of the realm. We have these different holdings, right? We talked about that here. So it shows that, and these actually show that there's empty holdings. And these holdings, we, we can build additional sort of structures and cities and stuff in these different areas. But in this case, we can't do this until we have, um, we have no holdings to construct. We don't have the technologies. We talked about this earlier, right? Whereas city planning will give us these extra additional holdings to build these cities in these different areas. But I will say that even if we had city planning, I just know this from playing uh, the game a little bit, be, we cannot build these until we become feudal. So we will never have the option to build out here until we actually go from tribal to feudal, which is going to be hundreds of years in the future. But we can actually click on these different holdings that we do have, especially the ones that we control directly. We can see that there's building slots here. We can go in here and we can actually try to build and construct these different buildings. Like there's a marketplace here, which will increase our taxation. That's pretty good. It costs money costs, uh, and it costs prestige. But we can see here that we are missing we're missing the money. We don't. So one of the things that we can save our money for is to get uh, these different markets and, and gathering halls and, and war camps and, and palisades and these different buildings and stuff like that that we'll be able to build in our holdings. So that's something that we're saving our money for potentially. Plus, we saw that we use money to recruit people to our court. This guy's a decent marshal. He's not a particular. He's athletic. That's kind of cool. Um, and we're, I'm just looking at these prowess. I'm, I'm looking at the prowess numbers. I flip through these guys. Would these guys be good champions? Mostly no. Most of these guys are below 10. I think anything that's like 12 or good, higher is good. We can invite more people to become champions by clicking on this decision. And at least three able-bodied men with prowess, three, uh, 12 or more prowess, will arrive that we can recruit for 150 piety, or uh, sorry, 150 prestige. But we know how important prestige is. We needed to go to war. We needed to pay for these men in arms. All kinds of different crazy stuff, right? All kinds of crazy different stuff. The question is, do we actually want to come over here and try to gain glory in this war by helping out up here? You know what? What the heck? Let's do that. Let's raise up the armies. So instantly what's going to raise up is the men-at-arms and the knights. Now, the men-at-arms have not actually fully had time to fully generate. Oh, that's why it's expensive. Okay, okay. It's expensive because what it's doing is it's replenishing the, the men-at-arms. They have to build up to 300. That's going to take a few months. Okay, and then once those are once those are fully uh, at 300 out of 300, the prestige cost will go down. So it's costing us a lot right now because it's just trying to replenish them in the first place. It's giving them their initial sort of payment to join up the ranks. So unfortunately, actually over here, uh, our men at arms are not ready to fight. So now I'm actually kind of like taking this back a little bit. I'm wondering maybe we wait a few months. Maybe we wait a few months and we uh, we see if we we if they need our help in a few months or not, and and see if we can get these men at arms to kind of kind of raise up here uh, a little bit. So let's unpause the game. We've taken care of basically everything. And what we could essentially do is, oh, we've unpaused the game. The game is moving. The game is moving. That person has become our our person here. They've supported us. We're getting a little bit more money because the church holdings, because she supports us. She, uh, she basically uh, endorses us. The church leader endorses us. We're losing a little bit of prestige again while we're gaining... Um, we're replenishing our men-at-arms. Does it say how fast we re replenish these guys? Full strength in nine months. So it'll take nine months for these guys to be full strength. We're into March already, so time is ticking. Time is flowing. We can see our allies in the war over here. Blue means they're our allies. They're coming over here. They're sieging out Northumbria right now. So they're coming over here. They're, they're already initiating the war. They're winning. They're going to win the war by themselves most likely, but we're just kind of letting them do their thing. We can actually try to get... Uh, do we already have an alliance with these guys, actually? Because I think we can try to negotiate alliances with these guys. He's a claimant, so it doesn't actually want to be an alliance. If we wanted to build alliances with people, we'd need um, unmarried daughters and sons to marry off, right? So 
having concubines that we can that we can start having some kids and, and making some alliance and stuff would be very important but i just i'm not pleased with with the concubine that is uh, sort of offering herself at the moment if someone like this if, if her husband died we could make this guy a concubine this is her son though holy cow we can't really uh, we can't really take him out you know what i mean it doesn't let you murder your own children directly you marry your you can murder your brothers did i say marry i meant murder you can you can murder your brothers though that is okay so things are happening. Things are happening. We're gaining stuff. Events will start popping up. Things will happen. And we can just sort of play reactively right now. We're gaining money. Our armies are replenishing. We are technically at war. Our piety is going up. That's something that we'll be able to uh, to spend. What we could do, actually, is we could actually just, just go. We could just start sort of going to war and taking some of these bits. This guy's just a tiny little guy with no allies. We can actually declare our own war and just a little side war right now. And we could just do this, so we could just, hey, we, we're coming for your we're county here. It's going to cost us 50 piety. we got plenty of piety. Let's do a little war of our own. So we have a reason to go to war right now. We don't have to build a reason. This guy's a neighboring nation. We're a Viking. We just, basically, because we're a Viking, we just have the excuse that we could just go to war with these people. And we're going to do a cheaper cost of spelling. This is to conquer the county, and, which is only 50 piety. I don't want to spend 500 prestige to, to subjugate the guy. I want to, I want to conquer this guy's land and, and take more direct control. So there we go. Let's declare war. The game is... Let's make sure the game is paused. We are now in our own war. So our, our ally... We're in two wars right now. Our ally's doing his own thing over here. We, we trust that he's going to win that uh, for us. This is a separate war. So when we raise up our armies, when we hit this button, it just raises them randomly based on our, our rally points. This is the one rally point we have. We can set new rally points in our military tab. We can set additional rally points. We could set one up here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, the one rally point we have is fine. I'm going to take this rally point and I'm going to move this closer to the actual front lines here. I'm going to move this over to here and I'm going to go to this rally point. And I'm just going to raise everybody up from this rally point. And the thing is, we know this guy only has the potential to raise 400 troops. So we don't even need our entire. We're going to do a little bit of a trick here. So right now we said we're going to raise the entirety of the army because we said raise all. Even if we did local, it would have raised everybody because first, the people that come in are men at arms. They instantly deploy. That's like our standing army. They're ready to go. The other levies need time to rally themselves. It'll take eight days for them to rally. What I'm going to do is I'm going to unpause and pause. I'm going to let these guys trickle in here. There we go. 14. That's enough. I don't, I don't want the rest of them. Four more days, they're going to rally the rest of the troops. That's enough. I'm going to grab these guys. Keep it paused hold control and move these guys over to here and that's going to cancel the uh the uh recruitment of the uh, of the army 14,000 against 300 is going to be more than enough it's going to be overwhelming odds here i think what we're going to do is we're going to try to engage these guys before they sort of get slip away from us so if we're looking at this is our raised army here we have different stats here we can see we have six champions we have 85 archers they're almost 300 skirmishers so they're almost fully re uh replenished but not quite. Now these levies and stuff will not be able to replenish while this army's on the move. While they're sort of uh, out and engaged and deployed, right? This guy is a flexible leader. This is the guy commanding our armies right now. He's got 16 martial skill. He's a flexible leader. We can go in and we can select different, different uh, guys to lead the army. This guy actually is an organizer, so he has plus 25 movement speed for the army. Minus 20% retreat losses. This guy's a guest right now, but he would be a decent commander, to be honest. Our son right now can lead the battle. He's got the Holy Warrior trait, which is not particularly good because we're, that's only good if you're fighting people of different religions. In this case, this guy is the same religion as us. But I think we actually just want this guy to be a... We want him to be a champion. What I'm wondering here is, though... Where's our son? Why is, why is our son? Didn't we force our son to be a champion? One, two, three, four, five, six. Eriker. No, he's there. He's at the top. It doesn't, I thought this was organized by prowess because it's at 14, 14, 11, 11, 9. But no, he's at the top. Our son is at the top. So yes, our son, maybe he'll, hopefully he'll lead the vanguard, you know? Uh, but anyways, this looks like a, as good as we can get it here. 
enemy uh, defensive advantage actually we've reduced that which is good because we're going to be attacking them in the taiga that does give them a defensive advantage so the fact is our leader is actually a flexible leader and he can actually sort of uh, deal with that these guys are actually going to go off they're just running off on their own we're not even going to engage them they're just they're just retreating they know that they've lost this battle we're going to come over here and we're going to sit on their siege that we need to siege their forts the way that we win this war the cost is so there's a few things going on right now right we talked about deploying our troops near the enemy that we're going to have to actually raise up our troops quickly and engage. They slipped away, so we're not going to be able to fight them. That's kind of a bummer, but it is what it is. This is the war that we're in. We can zoom out. We can see the, the, the light blue here is the war gold. This is what we're fighting for. If, there was, if they had more land, it would be in red. If they had allies, they would be in red. This is what we're fighting for there. This is our country in blue, and our allies would also be in blue. In this case, it's saying that the actual conquest of this chieftain so we are fighting for this chieftain. That means sieging down their actual castle. If we siege this castle, and it's going to take seven months to do that, it's estimating it. At most, it's going to take seven months. And we can unpause while we're talking about this. So these guys are going through a siege cycle right now of trying to starve these guys out and, and break the walls and, and, and whatever, right? Doing different siege tactics and, and so on and so forth. So it's, and, and this time is progressing. The siege is progressing. It's going to take about six months to get this done unless we starve them out or something a little bit sooner than that. But essentially what's going to happen is when we take this, we'll go up to 100% war score because, because this is the entirety of their land and we will have them completely occupied and that is like an unconditional surrender. This right here represents how well we're winning the tug of war. At 0%, no one's really winning or losing right now because nothing's actually happened yet. Until we take the siege, we haven't actually asserted dominance over, the, over this nation. If we would have fought that battle, we would have gotten war score for winning that battle, but it wouldn't be enough to win the war. We'd have to come and siege the war goal. This is the war goal. We're going to siege it, and because we'll have the war goal, and this will be their entire country occupied, their entire chiefdom occupied, it will actually go up to 100% and the war will be won. By right. Oop, an event. Our first event has popped up. This auto pauses the game, so we have to make a choice. We can't let the game run while we're making this choice. Uh, my vassal has information. And, or it has informed me of an obscure law in the chieftain that states none but the Jarl may be its protector. So we, we can hover over this and we could try to find... Okay, so this is a chieftain down here. So this is controlled by... Um, this is actually controlled by someone else, right? We don't contra uh, directly control this, this holding, but this might be an event that actually allows us to take control of this, it sounds like. Um... Because we're the Jarl, right? The, there's a chieftain there's a chieftain in charge of this. We're the Jarl, though. And this is saying that it states that we've informed that there's, there's a law that says that we should be in charge of this, right? Some obscure thing. Normally, such uh, archaic law would be dismissed, but it offers me a unique chance to put the chieftain, uh, Ivor, uh, my vassal and the current ruler of the chieftain, in his place. So basically, we're looking at this guy here, and he's our actual, um, he's the guy that's in charge of this area. And we can actually put him in his place because we have this law. We can actually press a claim. So we could actually say, hey, we have a claim to this land, dude. Like this is rightfully ours. That wouldn't give it to us, but that would give us a, a reason to um, a reason to potentially uh, extract this land from him in the future, uh, rightfully so, because we have a, we'd have a direct claim against this particular chieftain. But in this case, no, this is a great opportunity to make him happy, right? This is one of our disgruntled vassals. We can actually just make him happy or no. Ivor can keep the title by my grace. By my grace, he can keep the title, and he's going to like us for that. Instead of sowing more, uh, you know, divide. I mean, we we have our own land that we're managing. In fact, we can only manage three domains at a time. That's what this tells us. That's what that tells us. And then this is going to be a fourth one. We're going to have to do something about that. Looks like these guys are coming. They're going to try to siege our capital, but it's going to take up seven months to do that. We're going to have this one done in a second. We can see the little progress bar right there. So it's a race right now. It's a race to siege the, the forts. But as soon as this falls, the war is over. We have actually captured their daughter as well. So we've captured an important prisoner. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually ransom her before or so because I don't want her to get returned in the peace deal just by default. We're going to ransom her for, well, I don't know, actually. How does that work? Is she going to be returned? Doesn't explicitly say. We can win this war. We'll get some fame. We'll get some prestige. And we will, uh, well, our allies will get prestige. We'll get some fame. And we will also occupy, we will take the contested title here. I'm actually kind of curious a little bit. If we if we take this, 
does the daughter get uh, released from our jail? Yes, she does. Yes, she does. She got released. We should have ransomed her back before we did that, but that's okay. It's a learning experience. So we can disband these troops because that war is over. We're still in a different war, but let's just get rid of those guys for now. So now we are over our domain limit. We've taken a province, and this is a little bit uh, extended beyond sort of our core heartland here. We can give this. This is an opportunity to make someone happy. This is an opportunity to make someone rise up, and we can actually give this away to someone that maybe we think is, is a particular someone of, I don't know, of, of particular interest to us. Maybe someone that would be a good vassal. Maybe we're still trying to fit a better, maybe we want a better chancellor right now. Now we have more options to uh, uh, elevate someone. We could elevate this guy here. Uh, he's a 17 steward. He could be a better steward here if we wanted to. We could also try to look for a better diplomat. This guy's a 15. What the heck? I like that. Let's give that to that guy. He's a lowborn. What this means is that um, he doesn't have he doesn't have any land right now, and he doesn't uh, really like. He's just a nobody. And what that means is he is less likely to actually build up to have claims against us to want to feel like he deserves more, and he's not going to feel ambitious and stuff. He's just a little lowborn. That's going to be totally fine. We're going to give this to him. There we go. We've granted this random lowborn some land. He now loves us because we've just elevated him from the peasantry and he's now going to be there and we can actually come in here and be like hey why stop there let's also give you let's give you a job as our new diplomat because you're better at that job now we've made we fired this other guy right so he's going to be upset with us so we could go to our vassals here we could see that the dude that we just fired uh potentially doesn't like us is that him no actually we've got a few people in here that don't like us this guy still likes us barely. He barely likes us. But what we should do is now that we have a decent amount of people that don't like us, let's go to domestic affairs. Let's start working on domestic affairs and, and trying to butter these guys up a little bit in mass. In mass. But we're swaying this guy, aren't we? Trying to make him happy through uh, through the scheme. And we're also, uh, we could start working on some of these other characters that don't like us as much. But this is our scheme progress here. So we are trying to sway this guy right now. He's our most powerful vassal. And to make him our friend would be a good thing. So that's what the sway can help us do. We still didn't, we didn't capture any potential potential prisoners other than the one, uh, the, so we don't have any additional potential concubines, unfortunately. But for the most part, guys, we've done our first successful war. We've played through a year of the game, over a year of the game. It looks like a Jorvik over here, Hapton, our brother, is doing just fine. Doesn't look like he needs our help here. He's winning battles and stuff. He's doing just fine. In fact, we're actually at 100%. That war is going to end very soon. Because it looks like, I don't know, has this guy been captured? I'm not sure. So the war, um, basically the war that is essentially the Sons of Ragnar Lothbrook, invasion of Northumbria, that war is going to uh, is going to complete as as it is 100%. Hafton's the one in charge of it, so he's the one that he, ha he has to end it. But likely he's going to end it here in a second, because we're at 100%. Um, yep, there we go. War is over. The war is over. He has been imprisoned, and Jorvik has won the war. A curse undone. A curse undone. And after he was imprisoned, he was executed, right? In the name of Ragnar, because um, this guy was the guy that killed our father. He killed our father, he executed our father, and now we have wreaked vengeance on him. Uh, the twists and turns of fate have not always been to my advantage. Odin know that I was cursed the day I met Petty King Ella. Today, however... That curse has been lifted. The fate has smiled upon me and brought that vile spawn of hell to his grave. So he is dead. He has been killed by Jarl Hafton, our brother. Has avenged our father and killed someone that was essentially our mortal rival. And we can see that our brother over here has just taken some land up here. He's taken a big chunk of Northumbria. Now it seems like Ivor the Boneless is still fighting this war. Ivor the Boneless is still fighting a war against Northumbria, so he wants to take the rest of it and so on and so forth. We'll see how that goes for Ivor, but we are no longer at war. We are no longer at war. We're still replenishing a little bit of our men at arms, though, so I'm curious to see if that prestige will update in a little bit. For the most part, guys, we've played a little bit of the game, and we're off to the races, and we'll continue to, to play and work towards maybe forming the Kingdom of Sweden. Thanks, everybody, for watching this second episode, and we're going to continue to play reactively and sort of point by point and just talking about little tips and tricks as we go through the series. But hopefully, to be honest, at this point, I feel like someone could maybe actually 
uh, just take this hour of gameplay footage and tutorial, and they could probably be playing the game alongside without any issues. Uh, at this point, I think you have enough understanding of the game to go forth and play. But let's let's keep the series going, because uh, there's a lot more to the game than what we've talked about. It it gets it can get very uh, sort of intertwined and connect and complicated and stuff. And we will continue to explore the different situations that can occur and talk about the different things and how to manage different aspects of the game as we continue. So thanks everybody for watching. Uh, please leave comments down below. Um, I read all of the comments and respond to all of the comments, uh, all of the questions at least that I need to respond to, but I read all of them. And uh, thanks everybody for being here. I'll see you guys in the next episode.